Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. This is our regular weekly message, and today's message is entitled, Kiss the Sun. Our text is taken from Psalm 2, and Psalm 2 is in fact about Jesus. You know, Jesus existed before the creation of the world. He is in fact the great creator God. All things were created by him and for him. All things are subjected to him and will be judged by him. And that's why he is hated so much. The world, as Psalm 2 will tell us, does not want to be subjected to their creator because they have believed the age old lie of the enemy that God does not have their best interest at heart. So just like Adam, we, God's creation, his pinnacle creation, have rebelled against our God and against our creator. Turn with me please to the second Psalm where our text is taken from. And I want to read the whole Psalm, if you don't mind. Psalm 2, verse 1 through 12. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled, blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is God speaking here. He starts out with a question. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? It is in vain for people to try to go up against Almighty God. He is all powerful. He is all knowing. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere. There is no place that you can hide secretly to make secret plans against our God. God is in full control. This word translated rage is the Hebrew word ragas. It is a verb meaning be in rebellion formally, be restless, that is conspire to be in open defiance of a king at a coronation, implying in tumult and disorderly conduct in the act of attempting the overthrow of a government. The nations of the world have become noisy assembly, bent on rebelling against their creator and against their judge. They are in open rebellion, desiring to overthrow God's government. But why? Why would you want that? Because they think that they will be free. They will be single and disengaged, apart from God. Not knowing that their adversary, the evil one, the devil, is the one who is the actual hard taskmaster. No man is without a master. Everyone will serve someone. You will serve someone and I will serve someone. Either we will serve the God Most High 
or we will serve the deceiver, the enemy of God. But God has created us and he loves us. The enemy is a usurper. He does not love you. God loves you. See, no man is without a master. No man is without a master. I want us to look at the next two verses, verse two and three. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Before we address the kings and the rulers, let us discuss who these kings and rulers are rebelling against. What the scripture calls the Lord and his anointed. Well, it is actually God the Father and his son, Jesus Christ. As verse 12 indicated. Jesus is actually, or Jesus did actually exist before his physical incarnation 2,000 years ago. See, Bethlehem and the manger was not Jesus' beginning. He did not start there. That was not where he came into existence. Because Jesus, in fact, existed before eternity. He is from eternity to eternity. He is the everlasting, everlasting. The kings, the elites of the world, have set themselves up against God. The rulers, the politicians, have come in agreement with them to kick God out of the world that he himself has created. They've kicked God out of the schools. They've kicked God out of the colleges. They've kicked God out of their legal system. They've kicked God out of government. They kicked God out of the nation. Now they're even trying to kick God out of his own church that he purchased with his own blood. This year, March of 2024, this current administration proclaimed Easter Sunday, arguably the most holiest day on the Christian calendar as transgender day of visibility. They claim that it just happened to fall on the same day because they declared the day of transgender day of visibility from 2021. But don't you know that it's not that difficult to calculate forward three years to ensure that it fell on that specific date that you just selected? It's not that difficult. If you look at a spreadsheet of the projected dates for Easter Sunday, you will find that March 31st occurs several times. It's not that difficult to make the two coincide to make that day fall on Easter Sunday. It's not that difficult. I'm not saying that that is what they did, but why would they set that date during the special season? It's a specially revered season. And with the president being a devout Catholic, it makes it even harder to understand. What I'm saying, however, is if tolerance and respect were taken into consideration, another time and date would have been selected instead of choosing right in the middle of the Christian's most holy or sacred season. But as the scripture states, they said, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Therefore, it seems to me that the antagonism and rebellion against God cannot be ruled out. Rebellion against God is an attempt to cast from themselves his cords and to break apart his bonds. That is the reason for the rise of the controversial phrase on shirts that say, I don't care what the Bible says. Images mocking religious figures are seen in shirts. The middle finger with a statement, I don't care 
what the Bible says can be purchased. According to ChristianWebsite.com, I want to quote this. By the early 2020s, searches for I don't care what the Bible says merchandise jumped over 900% compared to the prior decade according to Google Trends data. The slogan remains popular for those championing a strict separation between church and state, reproductive rights, LGBTQ equality, and scientific integrity in policy making. End of quote. Searches for that phrase, I don't care what the Bible says, jumped 900% by early 2020s. That's a significant jump. The kings and rulers have plotted against God, causing the nations to rage against him. This isn't just a natural reaction. This is a trained response. The world is in open rebellion against our God. 900% is a significant, significant jump. Because the elites of the world are trying to usurp power from God, albeit in vain, they have planned and plotted for decades through their programming stations called schools and colleges. They have passed down their God-hated values to the next generation who now do not care what God thinks. They do not care what the scripture says. But the harsh awakening is you had better care because you will have to stand before Jesus one day. You will have to stand before him and he will judge you according to what you've done. And you will receive a sentence. The harsh reality is you spend eternity in one place or the other place. A place of blissfulness or a place of eternal torment. I want us to look at verses 4, 5, and 6. He who stands in heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. This is speaking about God. God laughs. God holds them in derision, meaning that God mocks their feeble attempts to usurp his power. Because nobody, and I mean nobody, can kick him off of his throne or overtake his kingdom. God knows that one day he will return and he will repay them, those who planned such things, those who hate him. He will return and he will judge those. He knows that he will terrify them with his furious wrath as he pours out his indignation on the nations that have rose up against him, those who have plotted in vain. He says, look, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. That verse is speaking about Jesus, God's promised king, God's promised Messiah, and Jerusalem is his holy hill. It's not Palestine, it's Israel. And Jerusalem is the capital. It's God's land, that's God's property. God hadn't come in the flesh as yet when this psalm was written. But the promises are true, and they prove to be true. Since in the fullness of time, God sent his son. And Jesus was born to a virgin 2,000 years ago. To all those people who chose to rebel against God and to rebel against Jesus, I have one thing to say. Jesus is coming back real, real soon and his reward is with him and he will give to each one as their works dictate or as they deserve. 
To the good, they will receive good. To the evil, they will receive evil. So whether your works are good or whether your works are bad, whether you believe or whether you don't believe, whether you want or you don't want, it's not your choice. You will stand before God. It is your choice, however, to choose which master you will choose. But you will choose. You will choose either God or you will choose his adversary. When he comes back, you will receive the rewards for your choices. Some will be awarded eternal life. Others will be sentenced to an eternity of punishment in the lake of fire. It will behoove you then, with that, thinking about that, to make sure that you care what the Bible says, because you will be judged by what the Bible says. So in order for you to come out on top, you had better know what the Bible says, and you had better care. Everything you need to know to gain eternal life is contained between those two covers of scripture, from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. I want you to look with me at the next three verses. Psalm 2, verse 7 through 9. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. The speaking voice has now switched. This is now from Jesus's point of view. This is a prophecy, the conception of Jesus where the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary just over 2,000 years ago and his reincarnate birth nine months later in the manger. Then it skips right to the millennial reign of Christ when Jesus will reign on the throne of David in Jerusalem for a thousand years, while Satan is bound up in the bottomless pit. Yet, people take it for a game. They take it for a farce. They have no interest in eternity. They have no interest in the things of God. Eternity is a long, long time. They have swallowed the life hook, line, and sinker. They're like this dog in this video who finds it funny to play with danger. Take a look at this cunning little dog. It climbs over the fence to provoke the neighborhood dogs, and as soon as they come, it immediately hides behind the fence, and a real fight begins through the net. It looks very funny. <laughs> it's all fun and games until eternity begins. Then there will be screaming and hollering and shrieks of terror and groans of agony. The lake of fire is not fun, but it is real. It is a real place. And no one needs to go there. Jesus paid the price for every one of us so that whosoever will can come and eat the bread of life and drink the living water. You don't have to be a certain level. You don't have to be a certain race. You don't have to be in a certain financial bracket. You don't have to be from a certain country. Whomsoever will can come and they can receive salvation for God's mercy is great. He has canceled the debt. We can have eternal life through the blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross 2,000 years ago. Let us look at the last three verses of the Psalm, Psalm 2, 10, 11, and 12. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. 
Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. It is not God's will that any should perish, but that all would find repentance, will come to him and receive forgiveness and gain eternal life. That is his will for each and every one of us. He wants you to live forever. He created you to live forever. So he warns them, O oh, kings, be wise, be sensible. Rulers of the earth, pay attention because one day I am coming back and I will judge the quick and the dead. God is so adamant about no one spending eternity in that place that was created for Satan and his angels that he sent his only beloved son to die for the sins of the world that whomsoever believes and put their faith, their hope, their trust in him shall receive eternal life. Jesus did not do anything wrong. He did not die for his own sins, for his own transgressions. Matter of fact, Jesus didn't even have to leave heaven if it was not for us. We were the ones who were standing in need. So instead of him sentencing each one of us to the eternity that we so deserve, he himself took the punishment meant for us upon his own self, suffered and died, and then was raised again to life on the third day so that you might live, so that I might live, that we might find forgiveness, that we might find reconciliation between us and God. Because, understand this, without the shed of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. We would not have reconciliation if it was not for Jesus. Look at what Romans chapter 5 verse 8 through 11 says. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. See, God didn't die for the righteous. God died for the sinner. God didn't die. Jesus didn't die for those who deserved it. He died for those who did not deserve. He didn't die for the hopeful, those who had hope. He died for the hopeless. He died for you. He died for me. We were sinners without a hope. We were lost. Yet he came, suffered, died, rose again to bring us hope, to bring us life and life more abundantly. The love that the Father has for the world and the love that the Son has for the church is indescribable. Yet, there are those who spurn what Jesus did for all of us. Why? Because they swallowed the line, the light pushed by kings, the agenda to usurp the kingdom from God, pushed by the rulers. As I said, they have swallowed the light, hook, line, and sinker. But the scripture warns, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. 
there's there are people telling you you can live any how you want you don't have to worry you will be saved God died for everybody so you don't have to worry that is a lie if you continue in the state that you've always continued in you will be lost if you continue breaking God's laws you will be lost do not get caught up in society's lie to mislead you. He said, let no one deceive you with empty words. Those words have no hold. They, have, they can't carry water. They're empty. They're dry. They do not have life. Jesus alone have the words of life. So many people are being deceived today thinking that there is no God. There is no concern about what's to come. There's no judgment. Live and be happy. Don't worry about tomorrow. What about you? Are you the one that has no concern about the future, what the future holds or what will happen about eternity? Or are you concerned about offending God? Look at these last three verses, or, or the last verse, verse 12. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. In other words, God is saying, pledge fealty to Jesus, or pledge allegiance to him. Why should you honor the son, you ask? Because God has given all judgment over to him and has placed all judgment in his hands. Jesus is the one that we will stand before and give an account to. And the scripture says it's a dreadful thing, a frightening thing, a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Do not be deceived. You cannot fight God and win but rather be reconciled to him and he will forgive you because God is a compassionate God. He is a merciful God. He loves you. He will forgive you. He will not hold your iniquities against you or repay you according to your sins, but in compassion, in great mercy, in his infinite love, he will take you. He will wash you and you will be white as snow, and you will spend eternity with them. If only you would come, if only you would turn away from your evil ways and forsake what, what you have been taught, but believe there is a God and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Understand this, Jesus has made a way for us with his own blood. His own blood. While we were his enemies, he died for us. While we hated him, he loved us. So now, come to Jesus. Would you like to know Jesus as your own personal savior? Would you like for him to fight for you and not against you? Here's how you can be sure of an eternity of blissfulness with Jesus. All you got to do is to repeat this prayer after me and believe the words that you say. Believe that Jesus will forgive you and he will. If you're ready to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me for I have sinned. I have rebelled against you. I have been a part of the plot. Knowingly or unknowingly, I have rebelled. I am sorry. Forgive me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. I receive your forgiveness, for it's in your name that I pray. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He will watch over you. He will protect you. 
I'm not saying that it's all gonna be hunky dory with no troubles, no 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 hardships. Hardships will come. Persecution will come. But God is for you. And he has an eternity stored up for you that these light afflictions, Paul said, cannot even compare to what God has in store for us. So if you want that kind of eternity, work for him. Serve him. Love him. I want you to find a Bible, whether it's on your bookshelf or whether you got to go out and purchase one. Buy a Bible, a physical Bible, a physical Bible where you can read. Turn the pages. Highlight with the highlighter. Memorize those verses. Then find a Bible-believing church who believes in holiness, who believes in righteousness, who believes that there's a right way and a wrong way, who believes in the power of the Holy Spirit. Join this church. Be discipled in this church. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of the Lord. And there you'll be with Jesus forever and ever and ever. Enjoying what you were created to enjoy. Peace, joy, happiness, and communion with our God. Thank you so much for joining us. Jesus loves you. We love you. I'm Kenny Yates. Be blessed and stay blessed.